Isaiah 60 verse 1 says that the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. You know what that means? The essence of God's goodness and his name is here. So let's just welcome him right now. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love and we thank you that you have Holy Spirit on assignment right now, right here, right in our homes, teaching us revealing the word of God, the mysteries of heaven, so that we can indulge in your will in heaven being done here on earth as it is in heaven. So we believe we receive all the help that Holy Spirit has for us right now in Jesus' precious name. Pray with results. Today, we're going to talk about power tools. In this segment, power tools. Look, I believe that God wants to revive our desire for the supernatural, for outcome when we pray. Jesus spoke about becoming like a child in our faith so that we could get kingdom results. Let's be honest here. You need answers, tangible results, not a religious exercise to make you feel better about winning some Christian lottery. No, you don't need a futile act of penance, so to speak, to somehow compete with Christ's perfect work on the cross. That would be futile. No, a thousand times no. You need, we need results. Your peace is at stake. Your family, your future, your well-being is on the line. God's will for you is on the line. If there ever was a time in all of eternity to pray with results, it's now, right this minute. So let's get busy and acquire the knowledge of how to pray with results, and that requires faith. Look, we need to understand how faith works. That's so important. It's essential. After all, faith is essential to prayer. Praying without faith is like eating without food, breathing without air, flipping the switch where there's no power, or a treasure map without a treasure. It would be futile, fruitless, yes, useless. And yet many good people have grown accustomed to fruitless prayers as though it's part of their moral code or religious duty. God wants to get you and I answers to our prayers and not become agreeable to a vain religious tradition that has form but no power. Form doesn't heal people. Faith in God gets results. Not only does faith please God, It makes us rejoice and be glad to be happy in the Lord. You know, Pam and I, we went to a restaurant with a few other friends one time. Our waiter came to to take our order, and after we had a few minutes looking over the menu, as we ordered, I noticed an interesting way of talking took over the table. What did you get? Well, I got the grilled salmon. So what did you get? Oh, I always get my favorite, a T-bone steak. I looked around the table at this line of conversation as it continued, and guess what was there? A basket of bread with some dipping oil, no other food. Each friend was claiming they had something that they didn't have, or at least it wasn't manifest. It wasn't there on the table. We had all been to this restaurant before and we trusted their ability to deliver on their menu. Nobody ordered ostrich. It wasn't on the menu. No one ordered shark fin soup. Not on this menu. And here's the other thing. Nobody assumed our waiter would choose something from the menu for them. We all authorized our own order. You could say it this way. We all expressed our faith in the restaurant's ability by believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouth what we wanted, what we desired, and we ordered from their book of promises, the menu. Someone there may have wanted a buffalo burger, but guess what? It wasn't on the menu. To activate your faith, you have to authorize your order. You have to. You have to do it. Not God, but you. This is your part. Romans 10 verse 10 says this, For with the heart a person believes in Christ as Savior, resulting in his justification, that is being made righteous, being freed of the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. Have you noticed sometimes a good waiter will have you confirm your order. They want you to confirm what you've authorized. Let me hear your faith again. The proof. What did you get again? 
Hebrews 10 verse 23 says this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. You see, people who order and then change their mind repeatedly or refuse to wait or walk out of the restaurant usually get very unsatisfactory results. One key to ordering is waiting. You wait for the order to be fulfilled. I want to help you counter the idea of prayer needing to be lengthy, time-consuming, and religious, worst of all. Here are 10 Bible prayers that are powerful and only two words. You're right. You're counting it right. Two. Two words. Can you pray a two-word prayer and it touch heaven? Move God's heart? Move God's hand? Yes, absolutely. The real question is, can you pray the two words in faith. Because you see, faith is the key. To pray with results, your prayer must be in faith by the authority that we possess in Christ Jesus. Boom, results. So let me show you what I mean. Here is a simple list of 10 two-word prayers. Yes, two-word prayers. Are there more prayers? Of course, but I, I wanted to get you going. Too many people don't pray because they're waiting for an official prayer meeting or a sign in the sky or a feeling that's holy or a feeling that's desperate enough. Don't wait. Activate. Detonate. So here we go. Ten two-word prayers. Now remember, all of these prayers are by faith in Christ Jesus. This, This is critical. In Christ Jesus. And that's essential to activation. So number one, this is a great prayer. Help me. The psalmist David made these kind of prayers famous. He prayed one. You can read it in Psalm 109, verse 26. Help me. Number two, guide me. We need guidance for a simple road trip, don't we? Why not for life, especially from God who ordained life? So pray, guide me. Number three, this is such a good prayer. Fill me. Why is that so important? Because empty talks will motivate you to do desperate things. So empty people are dangerous because emptiness invites bad influences. So pray, fill me, God, fill me. And you pray again, all in the name of Jesus. Number four, powerful, heal me again. Psalm 6 verse 2 cuts through the clutter and the petitions to God, heal me. You pray this. Just like Psalm 6 verse 2, heal me. The psalmist prayed it. Heal me. Number five, this is good. Once once you realize that you can pray for yourself to be healed, pray for others. Be healed. As a child of God, learn to pray this over the sick, over your family, over your children. Pray in the name of Jesus. Be healed for family, friends, even for people you don't know. You can walk into a hospital room and pray the most powerful prayer for an individual laying in a sick bed. Be healed. Number six, light be. Look, I've learned to pray this into dark situations like God did at the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Pam and I pray this together. In situations when we don't know what to do or we're looking for an answer, we'll say, light be. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Number seven, this is such a good one for deliverance. Be free. A powerful prayer to set captives free from addiction, from um, depression, from sorrow, from deception. Be free. Pray for your children. Be free. I pray for my dear son. Be free. Pray for your daughter, for your father. Pray for your grandparents. Be free. Number eight, here's a good prayer. Rise up. Pray this over a person. You can pray this over your business. You can pray this over a marriage. Jesus prayed this over the lame, the paralyzed, and over the dead. Rise up. Number nine. Oh, I love this one. Peace be. Jesus spoke this in the middle of a storm. And guess what? The elements, the wind and the waves, they obeyed. You can speak peace be to your mind, to somebody else's mind who they just feel like they're in chaos, they're in turmoil. You can speak it over your family. You can speak it over your home. Peace be. We have visitors coming to our home all the time and people walk in and you know what the first thing they say is? 
there seems to be so much peace in this place. It's because Pam and I are always authorizing, in the name of Jesus, peace be. And number 10, be exalted. This is worship. When God is exalted in your life, the gloves are off. All things are possible. God's presence is made supreme in your life. And where he shows up, where God shows up, the supernatural abounds. It's bound to follow. There is great joy in God's presence. Pleasures at his right hand and forevermore. So you can speak a in a prayer, just two words that glorifies God and say, be exalted. Again, all these two word prayers, they're powerful. Not because of how much you're talking or praying. They're powerful because of who he is and what you're praying in the authority of Jesus' name. That honors God the Father. If you'd like me to send you this list of 10 two-word prayers, I'll give you a simple link at the end of this message. I'll even write them out for you and send them to you so that you can print them out. Tape them on your fridge, on your mirror, someplace where you'll see them and be reminded every day to pray these powerful prayers. Prayer's not hard, and it can be so much fun, especially when you're getting results. Do you know what is difficult? A life without the benefits of praying with results. Trusting God seems to be the thing that we have to work at. We need help trusting in God, don't we? Faith has to be developed, grown, cultivated. Being a doubter, that's easy. Being in faith, that requires intentionality, paying attention, and listening to God's word. Listen, I've given you 10 simple two-word prayers. You can be so blessed just using these effectively in the name of Jesus. So let me guide you a little further into being practical so that you can pray with results. I wanna give you some practical tools here. Here are seven tools now for a power prayer, a power prayer. There is a very famous scripture in the Bible that outlines how to make a power prayer that gets extraordinary results. I've heard many Christian groups reference it, but then turn around and not apply the simple tools listed in this verse. You'll see here that outcome is conditional upon using these tools because listen how this verse starts with a big if, I-F, if, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Did you hear that big if right at the beginning? If my people don't believe that any prayer or all prayers get answered, because that's not true. That's not Bible. There are prayer meetings going on everywhere that are contradictions of faith and God's word. For example, look at James 1, verses 6 to 8. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man or that woman suppose that he or she will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man or she is a double-minded woman unstable in all of his ways. Now, don't let this discourage you thinking it's impossible to pray with power. Jesus himself said this in Matthew 17, verse 20. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, so it doesn't have to be big, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Did you hear that? Nothing will be impossible to you. That's amazing, over the top power with just mustard seed size faith. So you don't need a lot, but it's going to be stable. It's got to be stable and always pointing one direction, one way. So here are seven power tools you can easily carry around to pray with results. Number one, childhood status. Oh, what a power tool, childhood status. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you want to pray power prayers, you must be in Christ. Remember, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 started out this way. If my 
people. That's what God said. You can't get more my people than being a child of God in Christ Jesus. Father God likes to answer his children. He loves to. You may ask, what's that mean to be in Christ? Well, what's it mean to be in the Smith family? You can either be born in, married in, or you can be adopted in. That's why in John 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. Ephesians 1 verse 5 says, For he foreordained us, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted, revealed as his own children through Jesus Christ. Number one, childhood status. What a tool. Then number two, the name. So let's go back to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, If my people, childhood status, who are called by my name. So you've got childhood status, but now you have to appropriate the family name. You got to use the family name. Prayer is an authorization of power from heaven, utilizing, being utilized here on earth. Authorization is key here. Who is signing off on this movement of power? In John 16, verse 23, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, I assure you that my father will grant you whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am. You see, prayers don't get answered because we deserve them to be answered. They get answered because Jesus deserves them to be answered. Pray in the name, the name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus, which leads me to number three, number three tool, humility recognizing that you don't deserve to get prayers answered in yourself or because of your rightness or your merit is crucial. The third tool of 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is clear. It says, if my people which are called by my name will, what? Humble themselves. You do it. God has given you and I the choice of either humbling ourselves or trying to promote ourselves. Getting proud. Look at this example Jesus gives of two guys praying in Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> you notice that? Thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like that other man, you know, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector over here. Oh, how embarrassing. How loathsome. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. But then the tax collector, we go to him, standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, now remember Jesus is talking here. This is Jesus. Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility attracts power. That's why at number three, we got humility, which leads us to number four. This is a big one, faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says that faith is the title deed to the answers that you're hoping for. When you buy a house, the proof that you own that real estate is not the actual real estate, right? But rather, it's a document, a piece of paper, an official county back piece of authorization that says this person owns this real estate. God is a legal God. So when you pray for something, you need to know what's the title deed for this thing because I'm believing it for it, but I need the title deed. Are you praying for healing? Well, show me in God's word that you are the legal owner of it. You might point to 1 Peter 2, 24 that says, by his stripes, Jesus stripes, we were healed. Well, good for you. Maybe you're believing God will meet all of your needs. Well, what's the title deed for your faith? Oh, maybe you're pointing to Philippians 4 verse 19. Well, see, that's faith working. Faith never denies the facts because that would be lying. What faith does is simply supersede the facts at hand. For example, if you have a bill that you can't pay, faith would never direct you to pray, Lord, I believe, I believe these bills don't exist, therefore they don't. I am part of a billless society. 
No, faith doesn't direct you to do something like that. Faith would have you pray, Lord, I believe that you supply me with the right work assignment and you abundantly meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. See, now that's using your faith, your title deed to release God's power into the situation. That's called faith. What a power tool. Number five, pursue. Now, this may sound like something very simple, but seek. Pursue means to seek. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. See, it's easy to spend all of your attention on useless things, powerless things, even religious go-nowhere things. What are you seeking first? What do you put all your effort into pursuing? Is it God's word? Is it God's presence? Or is it social media? What your friends think? What pop culture says is trending right now? You must pursue God if you want the outcome of his power in your life. The Pharisees of 2,000 years ago pursued approval of men instead of the approval of God. Can you believe that? Because they liked society's high seats on the town council. They liked being recognized with their flowing robes and garments. They were desperate to pump up their Twitter followers and get likes. They liked pursuing man's approval. But you and I, we can use this as a power tool to pursue God's presence. Pursue. Be intentional about who you pursue. Number six, petition. Philippians 4 verse 6 says this, Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. First of all, isn't it good to know that God is advising you to be free from all anxiety, care, and worry when you pray? Oh, anxiety and worry are not to be the focus when you pray, but rather your petitions. Webster says that a petition is a formal written request made to an authority. Pam and I actually like to document a lot of our requests in a journal, and I keep them in a file so that we can look back and see how powerfully God is always answering us. I date them. I date them just so that I can remind myself about how on time God is. Let me point out that doing petitions this way is a tool and it also helps express your faith. Why? Because it's proof in your life of what you're believing God for. If you were to get arrested for your faith, would the faith police be able to find any proof in your life of what you're believing for or your reliance on God for supernatural intervention in your life? Petitions. Get a petition. This is a great prayer tool to use petition. And number seven, thanksgiving and praise. Count your blessings, name them one by one. There used to be an old hymn that would say that. Count your many blessings. Havers always pray more powerful prayers than not havers. When Jesus fed the multitudes with only five loaves and two fish, he didn't say, Father, Father God, this isn't enough. You got to do better. No. He said, Father God, thank you for this supply. Jesus never asks what we don't have. He asks, what do you have right now? What do you have? God takes little and makes it a lot, but it starts with recognizing what you have. You may need a supernatural healing in your body. What do you have? Do you have breath, even a little? If your legs won't work, do your arms move? You may be blind, but can you hear even a little? Start thanking God for what you have. Praise him, praise him for what he's given you. You may not have a job right now, but you can, can you walk and talk? Well, then start thanking God and praising God for what you have as you petition him for more. Count your many blessings. Paul and Silas, they got beaten and thrown into a prison. Well, what did they do? They began to sing praises and give thanks to God in the midnight hour. And what happened? God's power showed up and shook the prison so hard that every door swung open and the warden of the prison repented and got saved. Do you want to pray a power prayer? Get thankful. Praise and worship God. Thanksgiving and praise are the tiny keys that unlock huge, amazing doors of answer. These are seven great power tools to help you pray with results. Are there more than this? Yes. 
but I'm sure if you put these guys to work, you will be so busy managing the overflow of God's power in your life that you'll be busy celebrating for a long time. The thief on the cross beside Jesus accidentally even used some of these power tools. David the psalmist used these power tools. Paul the apostle used them and so did Mary, Jesus' mother. Rahab used a few of these tools to get free from sex trafficking and become one of the greatest women in the Bible. Daniel used these tools to get out of the lion's den. Joseph used these tools to move from the lowest prison to the highest palace. Even Jesus, Jesus, the only begotten son of God, used these tools to pray with results. It's how he multiplied the five loaves and the two fish to feed 20,000 people. I've personally used these tools with Holy Spirit's guidance and faith in Christ. I've received unimaginable answers to prayer. Pam and I have seen outcomes that far surpass our greatest imaginations, but isn't that what Ephesians 3.20 says? God's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. But it wasn't according to any goodness or righteousness we possess. No, in ourselves, we could never deserve a miracle. It was according to his mercy, his goodness, and Christ's finished work on the cross. We get what Jesus deserves. You get what Jesus deserves when you trust him, rely on him, and put all your expectation in him. I've had lost family members miraculously saved. I've had opportunities that I could never deserve miraculously provided. I've had heavenly provision heavenly healings, all because of what? My works? A thousand times no, because of what Jesus did and because I believe on his work, his finished work at the cross. Talking about Jesus, he's recorded in a very enlightened moment just before he goes to the cross and subsequently returning to the Father God in heaven. This is an amazing moment that will heat test your doctrine to the extreme if you're not in the habit of meditating on God's word. Brace yourself. John 17, verses 8 and 9. For the word which you gave me, I have given them. And they received, accepted, and truly understood that I came from you. And they believed that you sent me. Now listen to this, verse 9. Jesus talking. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. What? Did I just hear precious, sweet, kind Jesus say what I think he said? Yes. He said, I pray for those who are mine, those who have received and accept the word of God. He said specifically, I do not pray for the world. That's shocking. Oh my goodness, I'm shocked. Why do we pray blessings on the world that we pray on God's family? I'm just asking. We have taught something that has confused the world. We've hinted that Jesus prays for his enemies the same way he prays for his friends, God's children. So in doing that, we promoted this strange thing I called spiritual socialism, a form of one size fits all, which in truth is a complete contradiction of almost every parable that Jesus tells in the effort to give us understanding of how his kingdom worked, the kingdom of God. The Bible is full of conditions, lots of ifs. In the kingdom of God, enemies do not get the same benefits that the children of God get. In Christ, you have peace. In the world, the Bible says you have tribulation. That's what John 16 verse 33 says, and that's Jesus talking. Faithlessness is not rewarded with the same answers that faithfulness gets. Disloyalty isn't blessed with the same outcome that trust in God gets. Why in the world would we think otherwise? Mercy isn't sloppy. It's undeserved, but it's not random. This isn't a spiritual lottery where God just picks random winners to give an answer to. Look at what Jesus said a little further in his prayer in John 17. Verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, protected them, and not one of them was lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said to the Father God, he says, I keep, guard, and protect those in your name. That's the children of God. Then Jesus said, except, except who? 
He said, except those who are sons of destruction. The Greek word here used for destruction further is defined as waste, loss, ruin, misery. Did you know it's recorded that Jesus prayed for Peter that he would not be lost in Satan's attack on him? Well, why not Judas? What had Judas chosen to believe? You see, if you choose to have your life be a waste, a loss, a ruin, and align with misery, you're kind of saying, yeah, don't, don't pray for me, Jesus. I identify as a child of destruction or a child of hell. I choose misery. I, I prefer misery. I don't want you to choose misery. God doesn't want you to choose misery. So instead, activate your faith and turn on the power. Pray with results, not religious prayers, but relationship prayers, heavenly communication, authorized divine destiny. God doesn't do that. You get to choose that. That's your part. I told you that I'd give you a copy of those 10 two-word prayers. I'll write them out for you, and you can print them out, put them on your mirror, tape them to your fridge. Keep a copy on your phone for quick reference. Here's the QR code down here, so you can take a picture of it and easily get to the website, or you can just go to this website, and it will have that for you. I'll send you the handwritten 10 count of two-word prayers. Remember, faith pleases God. Your faith pleases God. Isn't that amazing? In part one of the series, I led you in a Jesus prayer releasing God's miracle power into your life. Let's pray it again because this easily can and should be a daily prayer. It's the exact prayer Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 6. So be assured this prayer works powerfully with faith in his name. Pray it out loud with me. God loves to hear your voice. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember Jesus is Lord and in Him we can live life strong.